Welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Shuchan Raghosh, Professor, Department of Ancient Indian History and Culture, University of Calcutta. We are dealing with the subject which is Indian culture and the paper is Social and Cultural History of India. Today I will be speaking on dress, ornaments and customs in ancient India. Now when we talk of ancient India, we have to remember that it continues from the early times till the 1300 CE. Study on social life is incomplete without knowing about the dressing styles and the use of jewellery in a given society. Here an overview of the costumes and ornaments along with some of the customs of the people in early India will be discussed. Elegant dresses have played a very important role in increasing physical beauty along with personality of the wearer. We all know that this has been an, from even from the earliest times till the modern times. In Indian tradition, it has been visualized through a number of literary sources as well as from the sculptural and painting arts. So here mostly as a source, we are taking art historical material and the textual materials. Though we have some representations in epigraphy also. With the development of technologies, introduction of cotton and silk and other material, the concept of dress underwent great changes. Throughout the different cultural period, in order to decorate the body and to improve the beautification of the body, man started different types of the ornaments, different hairstyles, and decorating herself or himself. So what we find that there was a change from a forest life wearing of bark leaves and others to cloth to ornaments. Ornaments also developed using various kind of materials and varied designs. For example, we have different kinds of if we go to the forest tribes, we find that they are using ornaments made of different kinds of leaves, bamboos and others. But then again the elite class would have ornaments made of gold, silver, copper. So these are the different ingredients through which ornaments could be made. People started to decorate ear, nose, girdle, neck, arm, leg with ornaments made of different patterns and materials. Man began wearing ornaments with a view to increasing his beauty. But in course of time, it became one element for the prestige in the society. Uh, you will come across images of courtly personalities, noble men wearing earrings, which are not generally common to the commoners. Food, clothes and shelter are the primary necessity for the survival of human life. The first man must have used vegetable bark and animal skin as a substitute of cloths to protect him from natural calamities. As I mentioned before that there was a shift from use of natural things to use of cotton and silk. The concept of costume had come down to us from the very past and the main purpose of clothing has to do with covering one's body and costume with the choice of a particular form of government for a particular use. So these are actually happening when there is a progress in the society. From a very early society, when the society is becoming more complex, we find that there is a change in the dressing habits. The dressing habits also become more complex. Costume also reflects social factor such as religious, beliefs, magic, aesthetic and personal status. Dress and ornaments worn by the people indicates their aesthetic sense. Therefore, if when we find a beautifully dressed woman, we can understand that she has a kind of a aesthetic appeal. The geographical factors also play an important role in shaping the human civilization. In respect to dress also, the geographical factors cannot be ignored. For example, when it is a very cold region, then you cannot wear cotton dresses, you will have to wear woolen dresses. So these are the factors and you will remember that whenever we are doing social life, either it is for food, ornamentation or any other things, geographical factors are most important and therefore history and geography go hand in hand. Now let us come to the types of garments. 
We shall start with the Vedic period where we find that in the context of the Vedic texts, the dresses that are re represented there continued for a long period. Those were generally unstitched. So a lower garment which is Paridhana was such a cloth fastened round the waist with a belt or string which is known as the Mekhola. The upper garment is Uttariya which was draped over the shoulders and we have a third garment Pravara of, which was also worn draped like a cloak in the winter. For the women we have depiction of them wearing blouses or jackets like things which is called Kanchuka and probably this idea of wearing jackets came from the west. Men usually wore turban which were fastened in many elaborate patterns. Perhaps on festive occasions women wore elaborate headdresses which is reflected particularly in the terracotta art of early historic period. In the Gupta period they are depicted either bareheaded or with head veils. In the terracotta plaques, sculptures and paintings of early medieval eastern India, we find that colored patterns of saris and very fine texture could be seen. Like when you look at a sculptural piece, the motifs come very quickly and uh, it becomes very evident and the drapery is completely diaphanous which can, so that you can see the body which means it is a very fine cloth. Therefore, fine cloths like Chinangshuka, Kausha, Patta and Dukula are mentioned in literature. Therefore, it goes hand in hand. Literature and sculpture goes hand in hand. In the inscriptions from Bengal, we find references to dresses of variegated colors, shining with jewels and of variegated slick silk cloth. Women arrange their coiffures in top knots that is called Shikhanda or Bans Kavari falling on the back. They decorated their coiffure with ornaments, flowers and floral wreaths. Even in the marriages, we have representation of being decorated with flower ornaments. Now if we look at the narrative art of Sachi and Bharat, particularly the Buddhist narrative art, we find that it gives us an idea of the various changing styles of wearing the antarya, the inner. For example, the elephant trunk or style, fish tail or the palm leaf style etc. are prominent. The kamarband which is actually the mekhola was tied in various knots such as drum knot, water serpent knot etc. And these are very beautifully reflected in the art. The figure of Shalabhanjika which is an epitome of beauty in most of the sculptural motifs provides the idea about the indigenous garments like the Antarya, Uttarya and Mekhola which were used in various purposes. With the coming of the Kushanas, we perceive a change. Though unstitched, unsewed garments were there, the Kushanas introduced cut and sewn garments. So we find in their coins the garments that were using, for example, they were using long coats, uh, then uh, lo uh, long trousers and these were emulated. Now, after the dresses, let us come to jewellery. In the sculptures here too, terracotta plaques and paintings, we find depiction of women as wearing crowns, diadems, earrings which are known as kundala, necklaces, hara, armlets, angada, bangles, valaya, girdles, mekhola, anklets, nupuro and toe rings. And you will notice that most of the jewellery are still in use. We do not wear them regularly but these are very much in use in during the time of marriages or other social occasions. In literature too we find references of these ornaments along with some others like a type of bangle called konkana, girdles composed of a number of strands of gems, money mekhala, jeweled anklet, shaped like coil string mani manjira. Now uh, let me talk a little bit about the mekholas because this girdle was very helpful in fastening the knot because these were not sewn garments. So we have to keep in mind that when we are using unstitched garments so ladies needed this mekhola and since this could be shown so we have so many different types and as you see 
that the elite women were wearing mekhalas which were studded with stones and other gems. So, lot of effort was taken to make the mekhala beautiful. Ornaments made of flowers and leaves were also worn by women but generally the poor folk. It is a very interesting phenomenon that we have a variety of shoes and sandals represented in the art and shoes and sandals were used by both males and females of wealthier class. There is a notion that the use of shoes and sandals came to India from outside but it is not perhaps true. Leather shoes were actually an influence from outside. The shoes were decorated with gemstones and were probably done with the golden thread or embossed with gold, gold work because these are for the wealthier classes. The Mahavagga has quite an Abuddha's text has quite an exhaustive discussion on different types of shoes. Patanjali refers to leather shoes and which were probably one of the shoes introduced by the foreigners because if you again look at the sculptures of Gandhara or the Kushana sculptures of independently even Mathura you will find that different types of sandals shoes were represented there. We have an interesting reference to the highly polished shoes of Vashantasena's mother in Mrichakatika. Now Vashantasena was a courtesan and quite well off therefore her mother could afford to wear a beautiful shoe. Another area of embellishment both by the women and the men were cosmetics. So the chief among this was a paste made of finely ground dust of sandalwood often colored with lac and other dyes which were smeared over the whole body or applied in patterns. Collyrium that is kajal or anjana usually made of black powdered antimony was very popular and this actually matches with the archaeological excavations of early historic period where we find that lot of antimony rods have been found. Vermilion, lac and a yellow pigment were used to mark the tilaka on the forehead. The lips, the tips of the fingers and toes and these uh, of the, uh, the palms and the soles of the feet were often dried with red lacquer. We have the famous book called Kama Sutra where we have reference to a Nagaraka and we find that the way the Nagaraka used to beautify himself by using cosmetics. Love for perfumes is second only to ornaments. Sandal paste and saffron powder were used for the face breasts and other parts of the body by women. One has to remember that here when we talk of cosmetics and the decorations we are actually talking about urban life. We are talking about the life of a Nagaraka and also of a Ganika or other women folk in an urban setting. Eyes, lips and teeth too were applied with some kind of paste. Different kinds of herbal juice were used to decorate their hands, feet, fingers and toes. Collyrium was applied to their eyelids and eyebrows with a brush called coal. Literature refers to the practice of applying to the body sandal paste. Tamil ladies appear to have used makeup box. So we have representations of toilet box which comprised pastes, washes and unguents. Preparation and use of cosmetics was one among the 64 arts, the Choshati Kala and we know the women who knew all these arts was considered to be an accomplished woman. Even in the art of Gandhara, we have depiction of toilet trays. When we look at the different sculptural pieces, we find that as I mentioned earlier also, that there was some kind of impact of the foreigners who were in India for a pretty long time on the dressing sense of the people. So numerous references to Chinapatta, Chinamshuka and China Sambuddhata, Kitaja stuff in the Acharanga Sutra, the Arthashastra and the epic show that during the early centuries of common era, Chinese silk became quite well known in India. And it was possible because we had regular trade relations with China through the silk route which actually went 
till the uh, joint the riverine route in the Indus and China's silk are said to have transported from the port of Barbaricon. Cartan Sune costumes like cloaks, chitons and trousers were adapted from the Greeks and the Kushanas as the utility was realized. We have representation of gods and goddesses in the coins they wear, where they are using chitons. Greeks introduced different other kinds of dresses too, like the Himatan. Another relief from Bharut shows the sun god in a northwestern short-sleeved coat, dhoti, a ribbon around his head and with the typical Greek leggings. Several types of caps were introduced by the foreigners. You will see that there are varieties. Indians used generally a turban called Kushnisha. Now, when we are talking of dresses, we have to understand that what was the material through which the dresses has been made. And herein comes the topic of textiles and fabrics. Textiles were very important in the world of Arthashastra. A great deal of information is available for woven textiles. It has been mentioned that there are varieties of woven textiles classified on the basis of color as well as the technique of the woven fabric. For instance, while white that is Shuddha, all red, Shuddha Rakta and partly red Paksha Rakta are the kinds of woven fabrics as they would appear in terms of the color. Uh, again in terms of technique, tightly woven woolens, Khachitam, loosely woven, Vanachitram, various pieces joined together, Khanda Sanghatya and woven with uniform threads, Tantu Vichanam are mentioned. So, when we have this kind of terminologies, we can understand that how important was textile or weaving in that period. Cotton fabric has been mentioned in the context that it was best procured from Kasi or Varanasi. The Varanasi is now very famous for the Varanasi silk saris, but cotton is also very famous. Kalinga are present in Orisha and parts of Madhura in South India. A silk fabric was called patrona or wool in the leaf. It is a kind of silk fabric made out of fibers of trees such as Babanian tree. These kind of fabrics were actually procured from Magadha, Punra and Suvarnakundia regions. Silks from China are described as Koshia or Chinnapatta. Now if we move to a particular age, for example, we move to the further south and the Sangam age, we find that in the Sangam age, women wore different kinds of cloths. There were varieties. They wore a lower garment and an upper garment. The evidence regarding the lower garment is quite clear. Women during the Sangam age wore spun cotton. It is said that women of the Naidal region beautified themselves with the garments sewn with the leaves and punnai flower. This kind of dress appears to have been used on special occasions and festivals. The girls of the hunter community also dress themselves with leaf garments. And this is not only special to the Sangam literature, we also have such representations in other literatures too. Coconut fibers were used to make garments and they seem to have been worn them. It appears that even the use of cotton, silk and woolen clothing in the Sangam age, the use of leaf garment was not given up totally particularly by the people of the lower strata. The decorations and the designs of the dress either printed or woven uh, leaves an impression that what kind of dresses they were eager to put on. The dress of the higher class of men consisted of two separate cotton pieces of which one was tied round the waist and the other went round the neck and covered the body. They were called Siradai and Meladai respectively. The ascetics wore an yellow garment called Tuvaradai. Kings and nobles used silk and cotton fabrics of finer variety. Fine milk white cotton clothes, designed clothes, reddish fine silk clothes, fiber varieties, imported silk and cotton and white, green and reddish colored clothes were famous among the elites. As we are talking about southern some part of the continent, we will now move on to the ornaments that were used in South India. The use of ornaments in South India dates back to the 3rd century BC. 
Decorating oneself with jewellery was one of the ancient practice among women. As we can see from the Sangam literature that women of Sangam age wore ornaments from head to foot. Even now, South Indian women decorate themselves much more with ornaments than persons from northern part of the continent. The following lists of ornaments of women figure in several Sangam works. For example, Pulakkam, Maharapakuvai, Vavantakam, Valampuri, Punkulai, Kulai, Odaimalai, Ponnin, Todivamani, Mallai, Pulipal, Tali, Todivalai, Kudaichul, Silambu, Paivagan, Padagam, Sarangai, Arivegam and Kalal. A rich account of the garments or ornaments worn by women of the age of the Cholas can be gleaned from the literature, sculptures, paintings and inscriptions of the times. Evidence of um, stitched uh, garments, especially the blouse and kanchuki also was found in the ancient sculptures. Tailors are stated to have been attached to the uh, Brihadishwara temple at Tanjavur. Even an 11th century inscription refers to the presence of tailors in Tamil Nadu. They were skilled in the art of embellishing with many pieces of cloth. Like we have this um, expression that Aneka Vastra Kandita Sringara Vidya Pravinargi that is and they were all decorative blouses. Dress and ornament are the most eminent form of individual as well as social expression. It is at the same time an excellent embodiment of the sense of beauty. For individual self-expression, no human activity affords so much scope to the average man or woman as does dress and ornament or personal adornments. So you can understand that the surviving pieces and the representations of jewellery in sculptures and paintings show that the Indian jeweller attained a very high standards in his art. Now from the dress and ornaments, I'll talk a little bit about some of the customs, particularly of hospitality that we find in ancient India. When a guest was expected, a special beverage called Madhuparaka was prepared and offered and this beverage is still now used in the houses. The guest was greeted in an appropriate manner, his feet was refreshed by a servant and then Madhuparaka was offered. He consumed the ritual drink in three mouthfuls and then drank a little water. The reception ended with a meal that included meat. Even if we have descriptions, even if it is a Brahmana household and the Brahmana does not have meat, the man of the house would see particularly by himself that properly meat was being cooked. There was a custom of sacrifice which became symbolic and all that remained of the custom now was that the Grihastha held out a knife to his guest who handed it back to him reciting a formula. This was a kind of a ritual purification. People were moving to different countries. We have examples of sea voyages, long sea voyages and therefore when one goes for sea voyages it is important that one does some rituals to save or protect oneself. So there was a right for voyages. So the traveler made his obeisance to the domestic fire. He placed a log on it and pronounced a formula appropriate to the purpose of the voyage. Then he drank a specially made beverage and took care to set off the right foot first. If he was traveling in his own cart, he smeared it with ghee from the morning's ritual offerings. If we had to travel by water, he hung around his neck a boat shaped amulet. His wife observed a mode of life resembling that of a widow. Now let me tell you, this use of amulets was also a common practice in Buddhism. And we find that there were Buddhist clay tablets which were offered as rituals, but these were also voyaging objects and were carried with persons who were going for voyages, just like a talisman. And sometimes these tablets contained the images of Avalokiteshwara and Tara. And we know that we have this conception of Ashto Mahabhaya Avalokiteshara where Avalokiteshara saves a person from being drowned. So a sinking ship can be saved by 
invoking either Avalokiteshvara and Tara. Here in the sutra literature and others we find that when a person goes for such long voyages his wife is very nervous naturally and she also observes a mode of life resembling a widow until and unless the husband comes back. So now uh, you have heard from me about two customs that is mainly about the hospitality and the customs of or the rights of voyages. The rationale behind the choice of these customs are, is that I wanted to bring to focus that early Indians were also traveling a lot. There was a notion at one point of time that early Indians were not uh, a very passive travelers. So here when we have in the sutra literature about the customs or the rights about traveling, we can be sure that th there was not no kind of a passivity uh, when the question of traveling comes. But of course, one has to believe in different rites and rituals. But apart from these two rituals or customs, we have several other customs and manners which are prevalent in ancient India. So we are not going deep into this, but if you look at the module which will be uh, in, in the EPG Patshala, you will find that there are a lot of customs and manners which are discussed in ancient Indian tradition. For example, we can tell you about the funerary rites. So after death, what kind of rituals or what kind of customs that has to be performed by an individual or was or is also very much given. And again, uh, in some other modules, you will be studying about the different kinds of ritual patterns uh, which relates to the ashrama system and other things. Now when we talk about the ornaments, the dressing up and other uh, embellishments like cosmetics and others, we saw from this uh, presentation and you have learned that there are a variety of use of different kinds of jewelries, different kinds of clothes. And that is also to be noticed that when we look at this variety, there is also some new elements introduced in different periods of time. So when we have in the Vedic period reference to two or three types of cloth, it changes in the post Mauryan period and again we have some introduction of the new types. For example, generally the tradition is of not having stitched garments. But with the coming of the foreigners, with the Kushans, with the Greeks, with the Shakas, we find that people took up using those kind of garments. Now, why did they do so? One factor is of course their influence, they liked it. Another is the comfortable part. So when we are using a dress, it has to be a comfortable one. So when people were going for some kind of military activities, so it was much comfortable to wear a trouser rather than a tight dhoti. So these are the factors that we have to factor in when we are thinking of the clothes and ornaments. Moreover, we also learned that our sources, for example, Arthashastra gives us a diff, diff, lot of uh, information. Then we have the sculptural art, which also through the visuals we can understand. But then we have literature like the Sangam uh, texts, which give us a completely not a different kind of idea, but some new thoughts, new ideas on how the dresses and ornaments were being worn during that period in southern part of India. Particularly, for example, I talked about the Naidal region, where you have a different kind of climate. So it is important that when we are talking about this manners, we are talking about dresses, we are talking about jewelry, we have to keep in mind as I mentioned earlier also about the geographical condition. So our taste of dressing, our taste of wearing jewelries also is conditioned by geography. There is another element to it and that is the ritual element. We often find that during the time of some rites, people dress according to the need of the rites and this is reflected in our art. So though we have sources 
uh, which and we always say that in ancient India we are limited by our sources but even the with the meager sources that we have it is possible from the sculptural account, uh, sculptures from the travel accounts from the textual sources to understand or have an idea of the different types of clothes and jewelries that people in ancient India actually wore. Thank you very much and for further details please see, go to the module in the APG Patshala.